This Jewish History Podcast is dedicated by Eddie and Lottie Sutton in honor of their children, Ralph and Michael, who are studying in Israel, and their love of Jewish history. And of course, we thank them for their support of the great work of Torch and the Torch Center in Houston, Texas. If you would like to dedicate an upcoming podcast, or if you have any comments or questions, my email address is rabbiwalby at gmail.com. Today's is a very serious and sobering subject, and that is what happens when members of our people are taken hostage by nefarious actors. When fellow Jews are taken captive, what have we done in the past? What are the proper ways of conduct? What is our history of hostage rescues? What is the history of hostage ransoms? What's the law? That is the subject for today. Now, sadly, this is not simply an academic, theoretical exercise. It's not abstract. As you know, we're in the middle of a war. And one of the main objectives of this war is the hostages. On October 7th, 2023, the murderous Hamas Islamic terrorist organization launched the most deadly terror attack in Israeli history and the most deadly attack on Jews since the Holocaust. Thousands of Hamas terrorists crossed the border from Gaza into Israel and began a brutal campaign of indiscriminate slaughter, mutilation, rape, destruction with inhuman cruelty. And as these terrorists or want to do, they targeted specifically civilians. In some places, they went door-to-door, just tossing grenades, ambushing civilians, shooting people driving in cars, machine-gunning young people at a music festival. At this music festival, over 360 people were killed. And they acted with, with heinous cruelty, burning some people alive and adding some fuel to the fire, literally, where it's a nightmare to identify some corpses. You just have a lump of ashes beyond recognition, little or no identifiable remains. Some corpses Hamas took back to Gaza to create further uncertainty and confusion and to prevent the families from having any degree of Closure, are they are they missing? Are they alive? Are they in Gaza? Are they dead? Are they dead somewhere here? Are they dead in Gaza? That, of course, adds another layer of pain and stress to everyone involved. But we know for sure that there are a great number of hostages alive in Gaza. Of course, Hamas released some videos from hostages, and the hostages come from a, a wide range. They're Jews, they're non-Jews, men, women, children, civilian, and military alike, old people, Young people, even babies. It's just absolutely sickening what these people did. There was a report yesterday that an Israeli woman who was pregnant has given birth in Gaza. Could you imagine what that is like? And of course, we don't know where the hostages are being kept. We don't know if they're all in the same place. We don't know if some rogue individual terrorist snatched some of them on their own. You wonder if Hamas actually has an account of exactly where everyone is. Israel, thankfully, managed to rescue one of them, a soldier, a couple of weeks ago. So obviously, they're now cupped in the same place. But now we're in the middle of a war. Israel launched an invasion of Gaza. And the dual stated purposes of the campaign are, number one, to eliminate Hamas leadership, infrastructure, military and governing capacities, that's number one, and number two, to retrieve the hostages. Now, these two objectives, they go together, but at times they may be in conflict with each other. As we know, Hamas operates a labyrinthine tunnel network, and there are very good grounds to suspect that at least some of the hostages are being kept in these subterranean tunnels. Can you bomb the tunnels? Are you risking the lives of the hostages? And what about hostage exchanges? There's been a lot of scuttlebutt about a deal 
the last couple of days. And obviously, Israel and Hamas are not in communication. The Qataris are the intermediaries. And it seems like there may be a deal nearing completion. Just as we started recording, this is Tuesday evening, I got a notification on my phone that a deal has been reached. And the details are not well known yet, or the timeline, just the basic contours. But it would include the release of a number of hostages. I saw I saw 50, I saw 70, I saw 80 women and children. Israel would commit to a pause, not a ceasefire, a pause, maybe two days, three days, five days. And they would allow some more humanitarian aid to enter and would, of course, release some prisoners. But I thought this was uh, an important subject to try to address from the perspective of our history. The whole subject of hostage rescues and ransoms in our history and our law. Now, unfortunately, this is not a new problem. We are no strangers to this subject. There have been many stories, countless stories of hostages and captives throughout our history. There's also a body of law surrounding it. And I want to address it uh, today while acknowledging and remembering that it's a very, a very sensitive subject. There are real people involved. And every person has families and friends and co-workers. And, and the whole world is also thinking about this and talking about this. And for most people in the world, it's, it's merely academic. But for our people, it's life and death. And it's not a subject that everyone agrees how to approach it. Just yesterday in the Knesset, there was a debate over a proposed law that would extend the capital punishment. Israel does not have capital punishment. It's reserved only for the Nazis. There's a proposed extension of said law to include terrorists. And present at these debates in the Knesset, just yesterday, were representatives of families of hostages. And they're arguing very passionately, very stridently against this law, fearing that it would cause the terrorists to harm their family members in Gaza. And the lawmakers are arguing, and they say, no, this, this law would give another arrow in the quiver of the Israelis to put more pressure on Hamas. Now, I think it's very reasonable to challenge the wisdom of proposing this law right now. But it's a picture of just how sensitive and how topical this subject is. And it hits close to home. I just spoke to a friend of mine in our community. His cousin, we believe, is a hostage in Gaza. His cousin, he was, or he is, an army reservist. And he was serving as a security guard at that music festival. And he was trying to help the party goers flee the scene, and he made a bunch of trips back and forth to save people. On his last trip out, he encountered the corpses of two women who were sadly killed by the terrorists. And in order to avoid having their bodies taken to Gaza, he lifted one of them to try to hide it, and he found a ditch where he placed the body and he headed back to retrieve the other body. And that was the last that anyone had seen him. And he is presumed to have been taken hostage in Gaza. Eitan Avraham ben Afrat. We should all pray for his well-being and for a safe return to his family. His cousin lives in our neighborhood. So this is a serious conversation, a serious subject. Very topical, very delicate, and I hope to address it with the proper gravity and sensitivity, and of course with accuracy. So let's begin. Redeeming those held in captivity has long been a very high priority and value of our people. And it began a very long time ago. It began with Abraham's intervention on behalf of his nephew, his brother-in-law, Lot. Genesis chapter 14 tells how Lot was taken captive 
in a world war, the war of the four kings against the five kings. And Abraham mobilized a fighting force of 318 men in order to rescue Lot. Now, our tradition tells that Abraham really had to persuade his fighters to join him. They were resistant for good reason. They're outnumbered and they're outgunned. If the five teams cannot defeat the four teams, what does our small little band of warriors, what chance do we have? And Abraham armed them and he bribed them and he encouraged them with the words of encouragement given to soldiers prior to battle. Tradition tells us that Abraham went with the intention, with the understanding that he may may fall in battle if necessary. Abraham was not assured that he would succeed, even though it was a severely dangerous proposition. He did it nonetheless. And of course, he succeeded in rescuing Lot and changing the tide of that conflict. So just getting started, all the way back to Abraham, we see that our nation places a great value on salvation of hostages. There's a second story recorded in the Torah of redeeming captives and the the seriousness, the severity that we place on this whole subject. After the death of Aaron, the nation was exposed. Previously, they had the clouds of glory. They enshrouded the nation and protected the nation and provided a degree of invisibility to the nation. These clouds, they were given to us in the merit of Aaron, Aaron the high priest. And when he died, the clouds were temporarily removed. The nation was vulnerable. And Amalek, our nefarious foes, they attacked And they committed a war crime in doing so. They pretended to be someone else. They pretended to be Canaanites, not Amalekites. Of course, Canaan, the Canaanites, they come from Ham, the son of Noah. Amalek is a grandson of of Esau, so they're, they're Semites. So Amalek pretends to be Canaanites, and they did that to confuse the nation. And it's really interesting, you know, what difference does it make if our enemies are Canaanites or Amalekites? Amalek understood that at the time, the nation, the Jews, the Israelites, they fought in a spiritual, religious manner. And their primary weapon was prayer. And a misplaced prayer, it's like an arrow shot in the wrong direction. And Amalek hoped that by masquerading as Canaanites, it would confuse the nation, and the, the nation would pray to God, God, please save us from these Canaanites. And the prayers wouldn't land, because they weren't actually Canaanites. And that was the battle plan of the Amalekites. And they were moderately successful. It was a very small success. They managed on capturing a hostage. This is told in the book of Numbers, chapter 21. But the Israelites were grouped and they prayed. And their prayer was generic. They said, please God save us from this nation. So the prayers landed. And they succeeded in their mission. They attacked and destroyed those cities. They ravaged them completely. Although it's not recorded what happened to that hostage. There's definitely not what we would call a proportional response to the capturing of a single hostage. The Jewish nation views the capture of even a single hostage as a casa's belly. Abraham went to war to save Lot. The nation went to war over an Amalekite offensive that yielded a single hostage. Later on in Scripture, we read about David's hostage rescue. 
King David, before he was the unchallenged king of the Jews, he was still being pursued by Saul, and he struck a pact with the Philistine king Achish. He thought that, well, David's done with the Jews. He'll be my ally. And he gifted David the city of Tziklag. And David and his ragtag army and their families settled in this city. But then the army went on a campaign with Achish, and they come back, and the city has been destroyed, and all its inhabitants, which meant the families of David and his men, they were all taken captive. Everyone had family members, children, spouses, who were now hostages taken by, again, the Amalekites. And this created a major crisis for David and for his men. Everyone is a relative of someone who's missing. Everyone's distraught over their loved ones. Plus, it was David's decision to go campaign with Achish. He was the one who left the town undefended. So the army is dispirited. and Everyone's mad at David. And they even threatened to kill him. And David consulted with the high priest. The high priest was part of David's following. And the high priest bore the Urim and the Tumim, which is a prophetic device tucked into the breastplate of the Kohen God of the high priest. And David sent some questions to God. Should I chase them? Will I overtake them? And the response was, yes, chase them. You will overtake them. You will rescue the hostages. Now, it's not clear to me why David thought it was necessary to consult the Almighty on this question. You know, what other option do you have? Everyone's family's taken. You're just going to do nothing? Does this perhaps mean that David understood you should not undertake a rescue operation unless you have some reasonable conviction that you'll succeed? Is David perhaps teaching us that undertaking a doomed rescue mission is reckless and wrong? Or perhaps David wanted to embolden the spirit of his dejected men. When he would tell them that God says we'll succeed, that will give him a renewed, vigorous, fighting spirit. Alternatively, maybe David is teaching us that every mission, every operation, every undertaking must be accompanied by prayer, must be accompanied with a sense of the invisible divine hand at play. Regardless, David and his 600 warriors pursued the Amalekites with speed. And he went so fast that 200 of his men could not keep up. And they encountered an Egyptian slave who was enslaved by the Amalekites and had participated in the raid, but had gotten sick along the journey. So the Amalekites just left him to die. And David and his men revived this Egyptian slave. And he agreed to bring David to the Amalekite kidnappers, provided that David would not kill him, and David would not hand him over to his erstwhile masters. David found an informant. And this Egyptian brought David and his men to the Amalekite camp. And they were partying. They were reveling. They were ecstatic in their plunder and booty. They were all excited, eating and drinking, exuberant with all their spoils. And David and his men swooped down and attacked and launched a battle. A battle that lasted 24 hours, and was a total success. Lopsided victory. With the exception of 400 enemy combatants who escaped, David and his men eliminated all the Amalekites and rescued all of the hostages. These are some of the biblical stories that show our history of hostage rescues, but also the importance of hostage rescues. 
And if you examine the Jewish law on the subject, you see that it's also a very high priority in Jewish law. One of the highest and best uses of time and energy and resources is for redeeming captives. The Rambam, in his laws, he tells us that it's more important than charity. And it's a peerless mitzvah. There's no mitzvah as great as the redemption of captivities, of those held in captivity. Someone who is a captive, who is a hostage, they're like someone who's hungry. They're also hungry. And they're thirsty. And they're naked. And they are in mortal danger. All the other causes that we try to invest our charity, time, and dollars into, all of them coincide in the hostage. And therefore, it's so important to go save them. And it's not just a benefit, oh, it's a nice thing to do. If someone ignores the plight of a hostage, Rambam tells us, they are violating several prohibitions in the Torah. We quote some verses, Devarim, Chapter 16, do not harden your heart, do not shut your hand against your needy kinsmen. Don't stand idly while your brother's blood is being spilled from Vayikra, from Leviticus chapter 19. A third violation, a fourth, a fifth, a sixth. Rabbam cites seven verses that a person who ignores the plight of the hostages would violate. And then he says, this is just a sampling. There are many, many more. And he repeats, there is no mitzvah as great as this one. In the code of Jewish law, the Shulchan Aruch, it goes even further. Any moment, any second that a person is able to engage in the salvation of the hostages, in the rescue of the captives, any second that a person tarries or delays, this is something very harsh. It's like they are murdering. It's tantamount to murder. The withholding from saving the hostage is, on some level, to some degree, tantamount to murder. So this is very serious. Our history shows it. Our law shows it. And we see throughout the Jewish world, in our philosophy, our law, our writings, our literature, it's a matter of great pride to be able to save, to redeem the hostages. As an example, the Ten Commandments, it begins with faith. I am the Lord your God. Who took you out of Egypt from the house of slavery? And many of the commentaries wonder, why doesn't it say, I am the Lord your God, who created heaven and earth, who created Genesis? That too would be, you imagine, an accurate characterization of God's greatness. It chooses to highlight God's role in the salvation of his people from Egypt and not his role as creator of heaven and earth. One of the reasons offered by the commentaries is that this is a greater praise of God. More impressive than creating heaven and earth, it's to save the captives. There is no greater praise than to redeem the hostages. The Jewish people in Egypt was like a million prisoners. A million captives, a nation of millions of slaves. And God extracted them. God redeemed the hostages. And that is how God characterizes himself. I'm Lord your God who saved the hostages. And of course we know any ideal that God embodies, we must emulate. And indeed, as we go later on throughout our history, there are many documented stories of the great sages, the great heroes 
of our people's history who dedicated tremendous efforts and resources to save hostages. The Talmud tells of the great Rabbi Yehoshua. He was traveling in Rome and he heard about an unusually gifted Jewish child who was being held in captivity. He was a very beautiful boy and a very talented boy. And he was told about this, so he said, I'm, I'm going to go investigate. And he goes to the prison where they held the Jewish captives. And he launches into a conversation with this, with this child. And from the conversation, he concludes that this boy is really special. He's a wunderkind. And he's destined to become a great leader of our people. And he committed right then and there to ransom him at any price. Whatever you charge, I'll pay for it. And he didn't leave until he paid the exorbitant fee. And indeed, a short time later, this young boy lived up to the potential that Rabbi Yehoshua saw in him. And who is he? He is the great Rabbi Ishmael. Ishmael is a Jewish name. You'll be surprised to learn. Rabbi Ishmael. Rabbi Ishmael ben Elisha. Now that name, it seems like, it's the same Rabbi Ishmael ben Elisha who became the high priest of the Jewish nation. And in fact, was the final high priest, the final Kohen Gadol of the nation before the second temple was destroyed. Now, some people quibble with the timeline because this would mean that the ransom was sometime before the temple was destroyed. He had enough time to be ransomed and to become a great leader and high priest of the nation. But that's, I guess, the simple interpretation of, of who this person was. There might have been another person with the same name. But this story is interesting because the the aptitude, the skills, the talent stack of this hostage, it really mattered to the great rabbi. Because he was convinced that this boy is destined for greatness, that's why he was so determined to redeem him at any price. Now, this same Rabbi Yishmael, but Elisha, the final high priest of the nation, he himself was ultimately killed by said Romans in a most brutal fashion. They flayed his skin off. He was so beautiful, they wanted to preserve his visage, his countenance. And that's how he died. The last man to walk into the Holy of Holies in a sanctioned way. This was someone who walked into the absolute apotheosis of holiness in the world. And thus, he had a touch point with his high, highest level of holiness. And he exuded this whole holiness in such a breathtaking way that his face was just radiant. It shone. And that's why they wanted to keep his face. But when he was a child, we're told, he was a captive and he was redeemed. Now, there is maybe a, a morbid epilogue to this story. After the temple was destroyed, and many of the rabbis were slaughtered by the Romans, not just Rabbi Shmuel, son of Elisha, many, many, many Jews were taken hostage. The Romans sacked Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, plundered the city, and took multitudes of Jews as captives, including the son and the daughter of the high priest of the same Rabbi Ishmael. And each one of them were sold at slave markets, and they were beautiful like their father. And it happened, the Talmud records, that the owner of the son of Rabbi Ishmael and the owner of the daughter of Rabbi Ishmael, not knowing, of course, that their slaves were related, they were chatting and they said, ah, my, my, my slave boy is 
the most gorgeous, beautiful, handsome kid I've ever seen. And the other guy responds, well, my slave girl's just absolutely gorgeous. The most beautiful you've ever seen. So they, they decided, they decided to put the two together. Imagine what the grandkids will look like, right? So they put them in a room and said, let, let nature take its course. Now, meanwhile, they're in a darkened room, not knowing that they're in the same room as their sibling, the Talmud tells us. And each one of them were in their own corner, refusing to capitulate. I'm, I'm the scion of Aaron, the high priest. My father was the high priest in the temple. I'm going to go spend time with this uh, slave woman? Never. And she's saying the same thing to herself in the other corner. I'm a princess. I'm from the family of Aaron. I'm going to spend time with this low life? No way. The whole night, they're in their corner, crying. And then morning comes. And they see it's their sibling. And the Talmud says, the Talmud records how they were crying. And eventually, they just passed away amidst a fit of crying. So ended the flower of our youth, the greatest among us, these heroes of all time. Unfortunately, the taking of hostages as captives over the course of our history was sadly very common. And we have many, many stories telling of of the great rabbis and their Herculean efforts to rescue and to ransom them. One memorable story tells of Rabbi Pinchas ben Yair. He was traveling to go save, to redeem a captive, and he encountered a river. And there's a fascinating dialogue here between the, the great rabbi and the river. He tells the river, okay, it's time for you to part your ways. I have to get through. And the river says, I, I, I can't split for you. I'm following the will of God. God wants me to flow. I will flow. And he says, well, I'm also here to do the will of God. I, I have to go redeem the captive. But the river responded with a very good argument. I'm definitely flowing. So I'm definitely doing the will of God. You, if I split, who's to say you'll succeed? Maybe you'll fail. And therefore, I'm not moving an inch for you. So the great rabbi tells the river, if you don't split, I will decree in heaven that you'll never flow again. With that threat, the river split. Obviously, this is a fascinating narrative. It's also interesting. The river tells the great rabbi, you may not succeed. Yeah, you have the funds. You have the resources to ransom the hostages, but who's to say that the transaction will go through? Nevertheless, the great rabbi goes, and he's not stopping for a ferry. He's not waiting, looking for a bridge. He's in a rush. And he's demanded the river split for him as a split, as the Red Sea split for Moshe, as the Jordan split for Joshua. Now, there is some very interesting Continuation to the story. The great rabbi insisted that the water split again. Someone was traveling with him. Two people were traveling with him. And then along the way, he ended up in an inn. And he had to feed his his donkey some barley. And the donkey refused to eat it because it wasn't kosher. It wasn't tithed. And the great rabbi says to the to the innkeeper, I'm doing this great mitzvah. You're giving my donkey untithed grain? And then later on in his journey, he meets the great Rabbi Judah, the prince, and they have a whole conversation. He says, come, come dine with me. Rabbi Pinchas ben Yara was known to not dine with anyone. He was a very pious sage. And everyone wanted to have him to host him. What a privilege, what an honor. And he always said no. He always refused. Rabbi Judah the prince asked him, and he said yes. And he explained himself. He says, I love the Jewish people. 
And if they want to host me, I want to accept their generosity. But I'm not sure if they really want to host me. Maybe they're just doing it to be nice. Maybe they don't have enough food for themselves and they just want to give me their food. And you are not allowed to partake in someone's meal if they don't have enough for themselves. So some people have the means, don't want to invite me. Some people invite me but don't have the means. Only with you, I am certain, Rabbi Judah the Prince was the wealthiest Jew in the world. Only with you, I am certain that both of my conditions are present. You actually want to host me and you have the means. I'm accepting. But not now. I'm still on a mission. And he continued along his way. And he promised the great rabbi, Rabbi Judah the Prince, when I come back, we'll dine. Now, we're not told what happened with the hostage ransom efforts. We are told what happened on the way back. It's very dramatic. Rabbi Pichas Mayar does, in fact, go to dine with Rabbi Judah the Prince. But something very interesting and surprising happens. Rabbi Pinchas Benyar is convinced that the angel of death is present and he has some evidence for that. And Roger the Prince tries to get uh, this angel to leave. But that, of course, is a story for another day. You can read it yourself if you want. It's in the Talmud in the book of Hulin on page 7b. Regardless, we see that this great rabbi makes it an absolute priority to redeem the captives. Raise the money, personally go and rescue the captives, not stopping for the river, not stopping to dine. This is a man on a sacred mission. Now, as you might imagine, over the course of the centuries, Jewish captives, especially female ones, were often used in very inappropriate ways by their captors. And this, of course, adds another layer of urgency to extricate the hostages from their plight. The Talmud records the conditional rescue attempt that Rabbi Meir, who's the primary author of the Mishnah, that Rabbi Meir did on behalf of his sister-in-law, his wife's sister, This was during the times of Hadrian. The Jews lived under very harsh conditions. They had no protection from the law. In fact, it was open season against the Jews. And his sister-in-law was taken captive. And he was encouraged by his wife to go rescue her. Unfortunately, she was taken to a brothel which is not an appropriate place for a young Jewish woman. So Rabbi Meir gets the money that he would need, a big container full of gold coins, and he says the following, If she maintained her righteousness and her piety, I'm convinced a miracle will happen. But... If she did not maintain her pious righteousness, then no miracle will happen on her behalf. He arrives at the place where his sister-in-law is being kept. And he disguises himself as a Roman nobleman. And he goes and approaches her. And he says, I'd like to spend the, the evening with you. She says, well, that that doesn't work. doesn't work because I'm I'm having my period now. She says, it's it's okay. I'll wait. I'm I'm plenty patient. I want to spend time with you. He's trying to suss out how how righteous she is. And then she tells him, no, don't wait for me. There's so many other women. They're all way more beautiful than me. Don't, Don't wait for me. So the great rabbi is able to determine from her responses that she's still very righteous, notwithstanding her surroundings. Now he's convinced that maybe a miracle will happen. So he goes over to the guard and says, I want this captive, I want to buy her off of you. 
Now, at the time, the Romans were not willing to part with their Jewish hostages. So the guard was not permitted to sell her. And he tells the great rabbi, well, I'm scared of the Romans. They'll punish me. He pulls out the the gold and says, okay, well, take the money. You keep half of it. Another half you use to just bribe the, your, your, your immediate superior. So he responds, well, okay, but what about when my superior's superior comes? The, the bribe money will eventually run out and they will want to know where is this prisoner? So Rabbi Meir tells him, I'll give you a way to get out of any problem. All you say is, may the God of Meir, i.e. Rabbi Meir, Elikad the Meir Anani, the God of Meir, answer me, and you'll be saved. Now, that doesn't sound like it's such a powerful elixir against trouble, but the rabbi proves it. He says, you see these wild dogs? He takes some dirt and throws them at the dogs. And the dogs run and start to attack him. And he says, the God of Meir, Rabbi Meir, answer me. And that's it. They just went away. Wow, this is really, this is really the panacea. He takes the deal. And the Talmud gives a very dramatic story. In fact, the Romans did arrest this guard and he was about to be hung, hanged. He was about to be hanged and he deployed this and they couldn't hang him. And then they went after Rabbi Meir. He had to flee. But again, we see another amazing story here that Rabbi Meir wanted to rescue his sister-in-law and there was really no way to do it. The authorities would not accept any price. And he went nonetheless because he understood that if she maintained her righteousness and piety, then a miracle will happen. And indeed, it did This maybe shows us another element about hostage rescues. Even when a rescue attempt seems to be impossible, we see an example of the great rabbi undertaking it, nonetheless, with the assumption that maybe a miracle will happen. The typical religious convention is to not rely on miracles, but apparently this maybe would be an exception. These stories about our great heroes investing enormous amounts of effort and time and money to rescue hostages, that should make it clear to all the importance of saving the hostages. However, there are limitations. The law teaches that it is prohibited to redeem a captive for more than the fair market value if you could even use those words, the fair market value of such a prisoner. Why not? Because you don't want to incentivize future hostage taking. If they know that, hey, the Jews, they always pay more for their captives, that creates an incentive for the Jews to be targeted specifically. We don't want the marauders to target, to deliberately seek out Jews to capture. If they know that, hey, the Jews, that's a gold mine. It's just going to create a perverse incentive. It's going to encourage them to do that more. And they'll even take more risks. You know, if the upside, if the assumed upside is higher, they'll take more risks to take more Jewish hostages. And therefore, there's a prohibition to not overpay. Whatever the market rate is, that's what you pay, not a penny more. It's a counterintuitive law. It makes a lot of sense. And it's highly relevant. Now, it's very interesting. You recall when Rabbi Yoshua was in Rome and he hears about this wunderkind and he has this conversation and he determines to redeem him at any cost. Was that a violation of this code? You're not allowed to overpay. So how did Rabbi Yehoshua go to Rome when he redeemed the captive that eventually became a great leader, Rabbi Yehoshua ben Elisha? I'm sorry, Rabbi Yishmael ben Elisha. How was he allowed to overpay? 
And there are two answers. Number one, that child was in mortal danger. And when someone, when a hostage is in mortal danger, you are allowed to pay more than their value. Alternatively, that child was destined for greatness, not an ordinary child. Someone who's really special, really gifted, and someone like that, someone who can, someone who has the talent and the ability, the aptitude to become a great leader of the people, someone like that, we may be allowed to overpay. So this law, the limitation of not expending more money than the fair market value, unless there is extenuating circumstances, it's going to be very relevant if we want to have any discussion about the halachic considerations of modern hostage exchanges, rescues, prisoner swaps, and the like. Now, over the course of the history going from the Talmudic era to modern times, there are many stories, episodes, instances of captives, of hostages, of ransoms. A famous one is the story of the four fortuitous captives. There was a time where, well, even in more modern times, the Mediterranean was full of pirates. And it was common for ships to get attacked and travelers to be taken hostage and to be sold at slave markets. And of course, the Jews would always buy and release, of course, the Jewish captives. And it happened once that there were four leaders of the nation, Gaonim, heads of the academies in Babylon. And they were on a fundraising trip and they were kidnapped. And the pirates didn't know, of course, these are four famous rabbis. They thought they were ordinary Jews. What do you do with an ordinary Jew? You bring them to the marketplace and you sell them. And various Jewish communities all across the Mediterranean basin purchased these sages, just thinking they're regular Jews. But eventually, each one of them became a great teacher and leader of that community that ransomed them. So this is like viewed historically as the the one example of divine providence, if you will, where the hostages actually helped proliferate Torah to new ascendant communities. There's another famous story that we have to mention, and that is of the leader of Ashkenazic Jewry, Rabbi Meir ben Baruch, known as the Maharam of Rottenburg. He's one of the editors of the Tosfos commentary you'll find in every standard edition of the Talmud today. We, we still have thousands of responsa, of halachic legal responsa, written by the Maharam of Rottenburg. He was jailed. The rule was he wasn't allowed to leave Europe. And he went, and he was captured, and he was held for ransom. And this time they did know the value of this great rabbi. And they demanded an exorbitant fee for him. And the communities raised the money. But the rabbi resisted. He insisted to not allow the transaction to go through because he didn't want the community to be exploited again. And for years, the Maharam, again, this is the leader of Ashkenazic Jewry. He was incarcerated. And what's remarkable about it, we, we have letters today written by him from jail. And he was allowed to have visitors, and he even had a yeshiva in prison. And he was there for the last years of his life. And even when he died, he left a will forbidding the community from ransoming his from ransoming his body. Eventually it was, many, many years after his death, it was ransomed, and it was buried in the Jewish cemetery of Worms, of Remiza. 
Now, over the course of the centuries, many Jewish communities had dedicated hostage rescue and ransom committees, and they had funds that they could quickly assemble to redeem Jewish hostages. In the 15th century, we have an account of Don Isaac Abarbanel. He launched a campaign to rescue 250 Jews from King Alfonso. In the 17th century, the great Polish sage, the Shla, Yeshaya Halevi Horowitz, he was held for ransom in Jerusalem by the tyrannical local governor, Muhammad ibn Farouk. This, this guy was a real piece. He, during his short reign as the governor of, of Jerusalem in the 1620s, he abused and tormented the Jews terribly, even the, even the Muslims he did. And he arrested this great rabbi, the Shla, Rabbi Horowitz, together with 15 other distinguished rabbis, and he held them for ransom. And the community was forced to pay an enormous ransom, and they could only raise about half the sum. So some of the leaders remained in prison, where they were tortured and abused. Later on in the 17th century, we have, of course, the awful Khmelnytsky massacres of 1648 and 49. The Ukrainian Cossacks, they rebelled under Bogdan Khmelnytsky, and they began this rampage throughout Europe, specifically targeting Jewish cities and slaughtering thousands upon thousands upon thousands, over a 100,000 Jews in the span of a few months, in some of the most brutal and heinous ways. And that created a, a hostage crisis of massive proportions. And we have documentation today of the imperative of speedy resolutions. They want to get rid of the red tape. And they made a rule that any city, even if it only has 10 people there, they have permission to tap into the communal funds up to 17 silver coins without going through any sort of process to, to petition for the funds. There was a collective fund and they could right away deploy that. That way to get rid of, to cut out, to cut out the red tape, to eliminate obstacles and regulations to enable the, the speedy resolution and redemption of captivities. Now, of course, even in, in modern times, this subject was, was front and center. During, during the Holocaust, if you think about it, we had millions of Jews who were captives in, in Hitler's Europe. Much has been said about the Americans and, and FDR, really. His decision to not bomb the rail lines to Auschwitz. Though it is important to note that the war refugee board that he established, he didn't really fund, but he established it at the behest of the Secretary of Treasury, Henry Mordenthal, that board is credited with saving 200,000 European Jews. And there are a lot of deals that could have been made. For example, Eichmann, he offered a member of the, the Budapest Varatsala, the, the, the rescue committee, he offered him a deal a million Jews who are on their way to death. I will give you a million Jews in exchange for 10,000 trucks and a certain amount of tons of tea and coffee and soap and some tungsten. There's a surreal description. This is all documented. This Joel Brand fellow meets Adolf Eichmann in a hotel. And this is the quote. It's unbelievable. Eichmann tells him, I have already made investigations about you and your people. And I know that you can make the deal. I am prepared to sell you, listen to this, one million Jews, goods for blood, blood for goods. You can take them from any 
country you like, wherever you find them. Hungary, Poland, Ostmark, Theresienstadt, Auschwitz, wherever you like. Unfortunately, this deal did not get consummated because the Allies, the Russians, the Brits, they did not want to empower the Nazi war machine, even though that meant another million Jews are going to be slaughtered. In fact, the British, they imprisoned this Joel Brand guy to prevent him from going ahead with this effort. Now, again, there are a lot of other stories and episodes of ransoms, attempted ransoms, controversial ones like that of Rudolf Kastner to save Jews. Some consider him to be a traitor. But I want to spend some time focusing on hostage rescues and ransoms and prisoner exchanges in modern Israeli history. So, of course, we cannot forget about the Entebbe raid. In June of 1976, an Air France plane flying from Tel Aviv to Paris was hijacked by seven terrorists, including four Palestinian terrorists. And they take the plane to the Entebbe airport in Uganda. And Israel launched a daring rescue raid. A team of 100 commandos led by Yoni Netanyahu, if that name sounds familiar. He's the older brother of current Israeli Prime Minister Bibi Benjamin, Benjamin Netanyahu. These commandos flew to Uganda and they, they landed and they impersonated Idi Amin, the butcher dictator of Uganda. They stormed the old terminal building where the hostages were being held. They killed all the hijackers. They killed 33 Ugandan soldiers. Unfortunately, in the rescue attempt, some of the hostages were killed. Three were killed. Two were wounded. One of the dead was actually Netanyahu, a senior himself. But over a hundred hostages were rescued and were flown back to Israel. Now, not all commando rescue efforts were successful. Perhaps you recall the story of Nachshon Watzman, Watzman. I remember this vividly. This is in 1994. I was seven years old, almost eight. And I remember we were living in Israel at the time. And it's a terrible story. An Israeli soldier was hitching for a ride. And a terrorist, I think there were multiple, might have been multiple, multiple terrorists in the car, dressed up as Hasidic Jews, they take him, they pick him up. He disappears, and a couple days later, this is Hamas, by the way, this is the same terrorist organization. A couple days later, they have a video saying that if Israel does not release a couple of hundred Palestinian prisoners, in a couple of days, Hamas will kill him. Now, Rabin, the Prime Minister, refused to negotiate. They got some intelligence as to where he was being held, and they stormed the location with, again, more commandos, but they were too late. And he was murdered by his captors, and also another soldier was killed, and a bunch wounded in the operation. And this, of course, brings us to the prisoner exchanges. Over the course of Israeli history, Israel has conducted numerous prisoner and hostage exchanges with its enemies. Now, many of them came in the aftermath of major wars. They conducted them with the nation states that they waged war against. And they were always lopsided. After the Six-Day War, a dozen soldiers in exchange for 6,000 Egyptian and Syrian soldiers. After the Yom Kippur War, uh, more than 200 soldiers in exchange for 8,400 Arab soldiers. It's always lopsided for some reason. They're always giving a lot more than they receive. But Israel has also conducted prisoner or hostage exchanges, rescues, ransoms really, with terrorist organizations. 
So, for example, in 1985, in the Jibril Agreement, Israel got back three soldiers in exchange for more than 1,100 prisoners, Palestinian prisoners. Many of them were terrorists with blood on their hands, including Sheikh Ahmad Yassin. If that name sounds familiar, he is the founder of Hamas. And he was in Israeli prison, and they released him. It also included Kozo Akomodo. He was the Japanese perpetrator of the Lod Airport massacre in 1972 that killed 26 people. This is the Jibril Agreement, 1985. This is not the last time that Israel released terrorists with blood on their hands. In 2008, Israel released in a prisoner exchange the notorious, infamous Samir Kuntar. This is a terrorist who committed a brutal attack that killed four Israelis and included the horrific bludgeoning of four-year-old Einat Haran to death by smashing her skull, her skull against rocks. Total barbaric monsters. And it'll give him back. But of course, the most egregious and lopsided deal ever made was the Gilad Shalit exchange. Gilad Shalit was serving as a tank gunner near Gaza. And in 2006, Hamas terrorists, they entered Israeli territory via a tunnel again from the Gaza Strip into Israel. And they found an Israeli Merkava tank and they blew it open and they killed several of its occupants and one of them, Gilad Shalit, they took as a hostage. Now Israel professes to never negotiate with terrorists. It's a total lie. Netanyahu himself, he, he became famous. He got his political start in the aftermath of his brother's heroism. He was working for a you know, private equity company in, in Boston. He, he went by the name of Ben Netai. He had kind of moved on from Israel to a certain extent. But he was, he had a, a, a paradigm shift. He had a epiphany. His whole life changed when his brother died. And he began to be viewed as an expert on international terrorism. And he launched the Jonathan Institute, where they had conventions, and he wrote books about how to negotiate, or how to deal with terrorists. And the, one of the central theses is to never negotiate. I think, again, I don't know anything about geopolitics or Israeli politics or military. What do I know? I wasn't trained in these matters in yeshiva. But it seems to me that his biggest mistake as a leader was the Gilad Shalit deal. Hamas agreed to release one soldier, Gilad Shalit, in exchange for 1,027 prisoners. And the amount of Jewish blood on the hands of these prisoners that were released, it's, it's hard to fathom. Someone calculated... And the number of Israelis that were killed collectively by all those released in the Shalit exchange is 569 terrorists who were responsible for more than 500 dead Israelis were released for one soldier. Now, one of the people that were released in this, in this deal is none other than Yichya Sinwar who was the head of Hamas and the mastermind of October 7, 2023. He had been in an Israeli jail, prison, since 1989. He's one of the most brutal and cruel people, even by Hamas standards. And they released him. And he rose to power. He already was a big name in Hamas, but his his brother, actually, Muhammad Sinwar, 
he was the one who abducted Dila Shalit. So that gave his brother the kind of the right to determine which prisoners are going to be included in this list. But this deal, obviously, I don't think anyone today still thinks it was the right thing to do. At the time, it was hotly debated. The media, the politicians, the rabbinate, the cabinet had to vote on it. 26 ministers voted in favor of it, and only three opposed it. Avigdor Lieberman, Bodhi Ya'alon, and Uzi Landau were the only three ministers that opposed it. The rest signed off on it. The military establishment as well signed off on it. Amongst the rabbis, there was a very spirited debate. Many argued that, hey, this is a violation of the rules. You cannot pay excessive ransom because that will encourage future hostage taking. And it's hard to argue now that that was a flawed argument. And there's, there's another wrinkle to it. If you exchange terrorists for a prisoner, it's even more problematic than simply paying an excessive ransom because in addition to encouraging future kidnappings, you're also reintroducing known terrorists back into the world. There's an old line that they say about this. You're saving someone whose name you know in exchange for a casualty whose name you don't know, for a future casualty. Now, at the time, some of the rabbis thought that it was okay. They said, well, we know we know the rules. The rules governing this excessive pay limitation, they do not apply when the hostage is in mortal danger, as anyone being held by Hamas is. And even if there's an assumed future risk to other lives, well, we have a definite risk to a life that's present. And when you have something which is addressable in front of you, that's going to supersede a speculative future danger. Now, of course, far be it for me to opine on such a weighty and sensitive and delicate and intricate matter. I'm just a, I'm just a simple podcaster from the Torch Center. He's in Texas. But I think it's important to have a basic understanding of some of the halachic considerations in these very serious matters. A dead body, for example. Is there halachic grounds, is there halachic justification to return a living terrorist in exchange for a dead body? Now, having a dead body is very important to us. To bury the dead with dignity, it's a very high value in our religion. Of course, it helps resolve uncertainty. It helps gain closure. It resolves potential aguna questions. What do we do when we don't know the status of a, of a husband and the wife's marital status is not resolved? These are all very serious halachic questions. And again, I don't, I don't feel qualified to address it or to take an authoritative stance on it. And certainly not when it comes to the security questions or the military or the political, the geopolitical considerations. Uh, they need to be addressed by the respective experts, not just someone who, who plays one on the podcast. But we live in, in very serious times. Our nation is at war. And it's very serious. And it could escalate yet further. We don't know if there's another shoe yet to drop, or a whole wardrobe of shoes yet to drop, it's important for us to be educated. And that's why I'm, I'm bringing back the whole uh, history subject that unfortunately I neglected for too long. A friend of mine reached out to me and told me that close friends of his have a daughter, Jewish who was an organizer for Students for Justice in Palestine. Now, if you don't know what that is, this is an organization that rallies in support of Hamas and in opposition to the, quote, Israeli occupiers committing genocide in Gaza. 
And this is, again, a Jewish girl. And parents are beside themselves. So a Jewish girl, she's one of us. Family's one of us. And she's taking the side of our enemies. I think it's a, it's a terrible failure of our community that we didn't properly, or we don't properly educate and inform our children. And if there's a void, if there's a void, it's going to be filled by other voices with a very problematic agenda. And I hope that our history efforts, our history podcasts, can make a small dent in the gross ignorance in our communities, even, and certainly the world at large. Because the truth is, when people are informed, they invariably realize the justice of Israel's cross. Israel never targets civilians. Never. And they go out of their way to avoid killing civilians. Even, I think, maybe too far, because they sometimes endanger their own soldiers. But people don't see it. And they could support the Hamas terrorists and justify them going and killing babies and women and children. It's crazy. And we have to do whatever we can to try to educate people as best as possible, because that is the only solution to this particular problem. Now, again, as we mentioned, by the time you listen to this on the podcast, this may be old news. But this evening, it seemed like there was a deal happening. And hopefully it's a good deal. And hopefully the people come back. And hopefully we could get not just these hostages back, but everyone else. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's going to be like a staggered process. Again, this is happening in real time. So I don't know what's, I don't know what's actually the, the fine print on this deal. But I want to end with a prayer, the traditional prayer for our brethren. This is a prayer that's been said by Jewish communities for centuries. Achein Rubais Israel, our brethren, the whole house of Israel. Hanasun Batsar Bashivya, who are in pain, in distress, and in captivity. Haom de Bayombe Abash, who are standing at sea or on dry land. Hamakom Yirachim Aleim, may God have mercy upon them. Viotsim Itzar Lervacha, and take them out of their constraints to, uh, to safety. Umafela Laura, from, from darkness to light. Umishibud Ligaula, and from enslavement to redemption. Hashtabagovazman Kariv, now, quickly, speedily, bin Omar, Amen, let us say Amen. We should pray for the safety of the hostages and the soldiers. May their efforts be successful. May they all return home safely. And please God, may there be peace and security for all of our brethren. My email address is rabbiwalby at gmail.com. I'm looking forward to having more discussions about history. We spoke last time about the background, the historical background of the Arab-Israeli conflict. We got up to about the year 1917, 1918. I hope to speak, please God, in the future about the events that happened subsequently under the British mandate, what happened then, and the events that led up to the founding of the state. Hopefully we'll hear good news from our brethren, especially those in Gaza, the hostages, the soldiers. May we meet again in happy times, in good health, and in great spirits. And again, the email address is rabbiwalby at gmail.com.